This is a podcast from the Nuffield Department of Medicine. Dr. John Freighter talks about his research into finding a cure for HIV. Hello, John. Hello. Why is antiretroviral therapy not the long-term solution to HIV? So antiretroviral therapy is fantastic. Over the last 20 years or so, there has been a revolution in how we understand how one might treat a, an infection like HIV, which initially, 25 years ago, we thought we may not be able to treat this. Therapy has changed lives. Um, life expectancy now, if you were to become HIV positive tomorrow, is probably the same, very close on being the same as if you were HIV negative. So therapy has done incredible things. There are issues, though, in terms of the provision of therapy. Can we get therapy to everybody who needs it? And at the moment, it doesn't look like we can. There are cost implications for therapy. It's incredibly expensive. Prices are coming down, but the management of HIV in this country alone is, is around a billion pounds a year or approaching that figure. So it is expensive, including everything that goes with it. But I think more importantly than that, despite being on therapy, there are the risk of toxicities, there is the risk of drug resistance, and people are still getting illnesses despite being on therapy and with the impression that therapy is working. So it's not the complete answer. And so we're starting to consider whether we need to look for sort of other potential options and ways of treating HIV. And what is the alternative? There are a number of different alternatives. One alternative would be to prevent getting it in the first place. And there are a number of ways of trying to change human behaviour, condom use, changing sexual practices, things like that. But human behaviour is notoriously difficult to change. And there have been a number of attempts. Some countries have done very well, such as Uganda, in terms of trying to change things like that and using condoms. But globally, it hasn't made that much impact. Certainly in the UK, still people are still turning up with new HIV infections, although they know the risks. So this is something that is ongoing, and there is an increasing number, or an ongoing number of people um, catching HIV. Um, the other thing would be to develop a vaccine, and we have spent millions of pounds and dollars trying to develop a vaccine, and yet we have nothing at the moment. Um, and some people feel that there may never be an HIV vaccine, and that is obviously of a concern, although there's still ongoing research. And then the third line would be to think about eradicating HIV, which if you'd have asked someone five, ten years or so they, ago, they'd have said that's a completely crazy, ridiculous idea. Um, but more recently, and with sort of certain sort of scientific breakthroughs and greater understanding of how HIV works, there is just a feeling that this might be possible, or at least it's worth exploring it just in case it is possible. And so there's now been a sort of a, a global interest in seeing if actually curing HIV infection or eradicating it is a possibility. And is there a possibility of considering a time scale to, to eradicate HIV? You can consider a time scale, but whether I can actually give you one is a different ballgame. I think this, this is an extremely long-term project. There are some people who would still say that it is completely impossible. Saying that, um, one person has been cured of HIV. There's a famous case of a, a, a patient known as the Berlin patient who developed a leukaemia at the same time as HIV. And the chemotherapy and the, the stem cell transplants that he had in order to cure his leukaemia also cured his HIV infection. Now this is incredibly toxic, you wouldn't want to give it to everybody, it is not a global answer, but it shows that it can be done. And then more recently there are two other cases now that it looks like they may also have been cured of their HIV infection, again through bone marrow stem cell transplantation. Um, and so there's just a, a, a gradual feeling that there may be more to do than, or there's maybe more possible, let's say, than with what it was before. In terms of timescales, certainly not in the next 10 years. I think we need to learn a lot more about how the virus works, how it behaves when it's sort of hidden in your body, where it's hiding. And then when we've worked out where it's hiding, we need to understand really how we can try and get it out and tackle it that way. So what are the most important lines of research that have developed over the past five or 10 years? The key thing in order to cure HIV and in order to take research for HIV forward has been the sort of the basic laboratory work to try and understand where the virus is hiding in the body. Is it hiding in the blood, in your lymph nodes, in other tissues, and try and actually discover where these reservoirs, which is what we call them, where the virus is hiding, and where it's hiding from therapy. So once the virus is in the reservoir, the therapy won't work. So the, the work that's been tr done to sort of work out where exactly in the body it is hiding and what cells it's hiding in is absolutely critical, and that's still ongoing. And then the other completely critical piece of work is therapeutic interventions and new technologies and new techniques to try and get this virus to come out of hiding so that the therapy can be used to kill it. And there is a new class of drugs that's been around and used by the oncologists for cancer for some time. And now it would appear that those drugs also work in people who have HIV infection. And some recent paper published by an American group suggests that if you give these oncology agents to people with HIV, it causes the virus to wake up. 
And so I think this now allows us to take that research forward and take on new trials and explore these agents to see if we can use them. So why does your line of research matter? Why should we put money into it? I think you could ask the patients that question. People are fed up of taking a tablet. You have to take pills every day for the rest of your life. And just impacting your normal life standards, the stigma associated with that, there's toxicity, there's having to remember, because if you forget a few tablets, there's a risk of resistance. So it makes an enormous impact. Yes, the patients stay well if they take their tablets, but the burden of having to do that every day, sometimes secretly because they don't want other people to know, um, is really significant. Um, and that's on top of the fact that not everybody who needs therapy is getting therapy. So I think looking for different approaches is absolutely critical. And how does your research fit into translational medicine within the department? I think this is about as translational as it gets. I mean, this is taking um, research from the laboratory straight into clinical trials um, to be used with patients. So the work that we do, we have researchers in the labs um, pipetting blood samples, looking at cells, and at the same time we have clinical trials where the information we learn from that um, is applied to patients taking these new therapies to seeing how they do. So it's about as translational as they get, I think. Thank you, John. Thank you.